Welcome everybody to our um, webinar today on combating the military obesity crisis. My name is Courtney Manning. I am a National Security Research Fellow here at ASP and I'm very excited to have everybody joining us today. Just as a reminder, if you have any questions about the presentation that I'm going to be presenting today, um, please just make sure that you put them in that question and answer column at the bottom and I'll make sure uh, to get to them at the end of the session. We have Matthew Wallen, CEO of American Security Project here with us, and he will be uh, moderating some of the, the discussion here um, coming up shortly. So thank you so much again for being here. And without further ado, let's get started. I really appreciate that we're all here today to join uh, on this really important conversation about the military obesity crisis. And what you will find out through the course of my short presentation is that this is a problem that goes all the way through the Department of Defense military active duty lifestyle from before recruitment all the way until after service has ended. So if we don't cover everything, um, this is absolutely a great opportunity to put questions into the question and answer. And I'll try to be as concise as, as possible, but uh, it really is an escalating crisis and one that if we don't tackle now, um, we will see only exponential costs and effects um, in the future. Wanted to give you guys just a little bit of a primer on what we're seeing as far as trends in the U.S. military right now. So what we're seeing since the beginning of the all-volunteer force, which technically started in 1974, um, but as you can see, continued to be rocky just as people who were conscripted ended their service between 1979 and 1980. Um, it has been an, a declining rate, right, of U.S. military applications. And these are applications for active duty service over time since the end of conscription and the beginning of the all-volunteer force. On the other hand, we have seen an increase in civilian obesity, and this is across not only the United States, but most Western societies and an increasing number um, of developing and third world societies as well. So we're seeing this trend, not just here, but everywhere. And of course the US military is no exception um, as we'll see later on. But why does this matter, right? Why do these two bullet points and um, kind of the difference between the rates that we're seeing here matter so much for military recruiting? Well, obviously if you are a recruiter, you are going to be looking at um, this star in the middle as your pool of individuals who are both willing and eligible to qualify for military service. So on kind of like that willing side, we discuss uh, propensity to serve, which basically just means how likely you are uh, to join the military and want to join the military. And we're seeing these kinds of trends among this population, uh, desire to serve their country and substantial amount have family members who, who enlisted, um, people who are familiar and aware of the military, maybe through ROTC or through a teacher or a parent or a family friend who had been through the military and believe that the military fits into their long-term goals, right? And then also we wanna make sure that of those willing applicants, they are eligible to serve. So in order to be eligible to serve, you need to be a US citizen or resident alien between 17 to 35 years old. You need to meet minimum fitness standards. And this includes a um, height to rate ratio, which is currently defined as body composition, but has been defined as a number of other terms and language over the past uh, 20 years. You need to meet minimum fitness standards um, which just involves passing a test to ensure that you are physically qualified and can be combat capable if necessary. And you have to have a high school diploma or a GED. And what we're seeing right now is that obviously as applicants continue to decline, um, we need to have a shift in kind of how we are broadening either the pool of eligible applicants or the pool of willing applicants, right? Obviously expanding the pool of willing applicants so that more people uh, do have that desire to serve. That can be done through, for instance, bonuses, raising the uh, salaries of individuals who are joining our military, making uh, the military service, specifically the active duty, uh, seem like a, a great fit for individual people's career goals, education, all of that stuff. But as far as eligibility is concerned, that's about, you know, taking the people who are already willing and making sure that they can fulfill their terms of service until, until the end of their pr uh, process. And as you can see, when it comes to those disqualifications, those people who are willing, who are ready in a moment's notice to sign up and enlist, 
a lot of them, the majority of them, right, face some form of hurdle in this process to join the U.S. military. And the reasons why are very diverse. So we have, um, for one, body composition as the standard and has been like the standard and primary disqualifier of interested and willing U.S. military applicants since before 2010. Now, every once in a while, right, it'll flip flop between body composition and vision defects. And that's simply because it depends on the number of people who need glasses. But the difference between body composition and vision or allergic reactions, right, or all of these other unclassified codes is that when it comes to body composition, um, you really can't just put on a pair of glasses, right, and make that go away. Uh, most vision defects, you know, all you do is get a doctor to sign off on the fact that you do have glasses and those are your current prescription and that's it. So we don't worry so much about vision defects when it comes to trying to improve the number of qualified candidates that we have for military enlistment. We're really worried about body composition. And unfortunately, because this has become such an escalating trend and because there has been so much attention brought to this issue, um, and for a number of other cultural factors, which we'll color, cover later, this data is no longer published as of 2017. So if you were to look at this chart from 2017, this is what it would look like. If you're going to look at the chart from 2016, 15, 14, 13 onwards, backwards, you'd see something that looks very similar to this. Um, after 2017, unfortunately, all of these other categories remain, but this specific bar is removed. And we'll see why in a little bit later. So let's say, right, that you are in charge of coming up with solutions for this problem that we've detailed. We have an increasingly shrinked, a shrinking number of people in this star category who are both willing and eligible, right? And you have a lot of people who um, are really interested in joining the military, but unfortunately are not currently eligible because of body composition. Well, you can do a few things, right? You can reduce body composition standards to accept more applicants. You can maintain the current body composition standards and accept fewer but better qualified applicants, right? Or you can introduce and enforce sustainable weight management initiatives. And obviously, I've set you up a little bit. You're going to say, oh, it's the third one, right? But when we actually look at the trade-offs between some of these choices that um, recruiters and military leaders are given, you can see that there's kind of this trade-off triangle of combat readiness, cost savings, and force structure. And in this case, right, combat readiness represents the high qualities and the high effectiveness of a active duty force to um, achieve its mission and to be operationally ready. Uh, cost savings is pretty obvious and force structure in this case is having the manpower, the number of individuals who are, who are able to serve, right? And if we look at the three um, recommendations, the three choices from earlier, you can see that, uh, yes, you could accept fewer but better qualified applicants, right? This saves you money because, of course, you do not have to pay for advanced initiatives, whether that be in education, weight management, or um, both. You can enforce sustainable weight management initiatives, which would make your force structure larger because now you're accepting more willing applicants and increase the overall readiness of your force because those individuals who are joining become more fit. But unfortunately, that does come with the downside of cost savings, and it's not an easy thing to do. Obviously, if it were easy to lose weight and to help other people lose weight, we would not have the set, like the global obesity crisis that we're in right now. It's really an epidemic, so it's not as easy as you might think. And then, of course, you have the option that makes it both cost effective and increases your manpower, right, which is to reduce body composition standards. And that is what we have been seeing as the trend over the past 10 years, right? Um, we're accepting more overweight applicants, we're getting them to pass weight through a number of programs that I'll get into detail in the next slide, and we're reducing the evidence that things are getting worse, right? Um, and this is, for all intents and purposes, a pretty cost-effective measure until we get into the readiness problems that we're going to be explaining in just a little while. So, as you can see, the strategy that we've detailed, right, both letting more people in and lowering the bar has led to a, you know, increased number of individuals, whether they are qualified or not, entering our service compared to the number of individuals who are applying. So if that sounds complicated, I'm explaining it in this chart. You can see that the disqualifications in blue here um, have steadily gone down, which means that more individuals are being accepted and fewer are being disqualified over time. 
and enlisted applications, right? The amount of people who are applying for service really only went up during this arms program period between 2005 and 2009. And you might ask, what is the arms period, right? The arms period was a trial run of the US uh, Army, which allowed overweight people to join the military, to join the army, as long as they went through kind of a um, fitness boot camp, pre boot camp program uh, that would get them fit again. And they were monitored and they were tracked to see how well they did, even though they were overweight and currently over, you know, the military weight standards of the time. And as you can see, the program was incredibly successful. So 26% increase in military applications at the um, specific junctures, right, where they were accepting these, these individuals. And um, up to 99% of them were overweight. This was a, this was research that was overseen by RAND in the Department of Defense. And it really only increased the amount of individuals who were willing and eligible besides their weight to join, just letting them join without having to reduce their weight before they got in. And you can see that that improved. Now, why did they end the program? They ended the program because at the 2008 to 2009 financial crisis, we were expecting to see an increase in enlisted applications. That would mean that the um, program no longer needed to be in force because we were expecting a much higher number of enlisted applications as a result of the financial crisis, simply because there weren't as many other jobs, there weren't as many other options for individuals. And historically, the trend has been when we are in a recession, depression, economic uh, downturn, people tend to join the military more. Now, for a number of reasons we won't get into, during the 2008 financial crisis, this did not happen. So what ended up happening was, is they cut off this program. They, you know, reiterated the fitness standards that had been pre-2006, and they uh, immediately saw a decline in applications, and applications have continued to decline ever since into 2023. So now we're in a worse recruiting crisis environment than ever, and we've started to bring back ARMS. So we've now, as of 2019, started ARMS 2.0, or you may have heard it as the Future Soldier Preparatory Course, which is a pre-boot camp boot camp that gets people into fighting shape, um, usually pretty aggressively with 1.75% decreases in overall body weight in uh, every week, which is pretty um, both impressive and a little scary. Uh, and what we're seeing from those individuals, right, is that they're getting right at that line where they're able to join the service and then able to successfully enter the service, therefore, you know, bolstering the amount of total enlisted we are able to achieve out of the enlisted applications that we receive. Courtney, can we pause for a moment just to discuss uh, the idea of lowering standards? Because you, you've mentioned this, that the military is lowering the standards. But what you have on the previous slide, you know, indicates waivers. So can can you explain whether the military is actually lowering the standards or are they simply letting people in that don't meet the standard? That's a great question. And it is both. Right. So we both have an alteration in the um, waist to height ratios that we are accepting in people since the 1990s. So for instance, um, pre 1990s, you're looking at a BMI of 25 as being overweight or as the military used to call it over fat. And then at 30 is the rate that people are considered obese. Uh, and 25 used to be that limit for when you would not be able to serve until you reduce your weight. But as that time has gone on, it's climbed steadily higher and higher. And now, uh, depending on your, your age, your gender, um, and your height, you might have a 26 or 27 BMI and still be able to serve without any additional exceptions or waivers. Now, if you are over that, you know, increasingly loose requirement, you can still receive an exemption or a waiver. So um, the services tend to consider these exceptions. The Marine Corps is unique in that they do grant physical waivers for weight. They're just called weight waivers. And these comprise about half of all of the waivers granted. So um, those, you know, individuals get to basically pass either another test, an alternative um, form of, of body measurement, uh, or they're just given a doctor's, you know, exception regardless and are just able to enter service. Other individuals, maybe if you are in a different service, um, you receive an exception. And unfortunately, we do not have a rate for the other services because the Marine Corps believe that it is, um, you know, correctly assigning these weight waivers to individuals and correctly publishing them. The other services believe that these are exceptions and should not be published. So um, we're seeing a large combination of, of different factors. It could be people that are coming in, going to the future soldier preparatory course, um, you know, becoming 
fit enough to serve and then getting entered into the program, they could have received a waiver, they could have seen a doctor and grant, be granted an exception. There's a number of different reasons why um, an individual who is initially disqualified for, for weight might ultimately enter service. And at 50% of those waivers being for weight disqualifications, that really shows you how how, pro, how big the problem is as, as they're entering the service. You know, we've got people who are interested in joining, but if 50% of them are being, you know, for, for waiver purposes, being let in, that, that shows you how rough it is for, for military recruiters. Courtney, there's also a question coming in about, about BMI. I don't know if you wanted to comment on that now or if you wanted to leave that for later in the, in the presentation. Yeah, um, and I do want to talk about that. And I know that it's a hot topic because, of course, the standard um, inclusion, the standard note that is stated on a lot of uh, kind of publicity materials about this topic, especially from the Department of Defense, pretty much exclusively from the Department of Defense, um, is that the BMI system is either, you know, completely outdated, doesn't apply to people with high muscle mass, doesn't apply to people from certain ethnic groups or genders. And this is an interesting topic because as we've discovered and combing through all of the different studies that have been conducted on this topic, BMI is definitely not um, the most accurate indicator, but number one, it is unfortunately the best indicator that we have that doesn't need to be conducted by a medical professional in a doctor's office, right? So if you don't believe in BMI as a, as a concept, um, that still fits into our recommendations to ultimately be able to get people seen by a doctor so that a more uh, accurate test can be conducted on these individuals. And number two, unfortunately, it swings the other way than what people think. So people tend to assume that because BMI is inaccurate, that means there's a bunch of healthy people running around who um, are being unfairly categorized as being obese and being put into all sorts of horrific programs as a result. And this is not the case. In fact, when the BMI is inaccurate on service members, it's because they are underestimating the percentage of excess body fat that is in these service members. So when the DOD, and this is all the services, they've all conducted tests on um, how accurate BMI is compared to these really advanced, expensive body imaging tools. The most popular one is called Bod Pod, where they put you into this um, giant egg and it scans, you know, your entire body. What they find is that people have between eight to 30% more fat than is predicted than BMI. So what is, you know, the true statement is that yes, BMI is inaccurate for around uh, three to 4% of individuals, right? And like, that is a serious thing that we need to consider. But when it is inaccurate, 99% of the time, it is underestimating the amount of excess fat, which means that if we are going to be following the science, we actually would be reducing, right, the BMI limits for individuals to be categorized as overweight or having obesity. Um, and what we're seeing is the opposite. Um, and this is a really fascinating kind of topic. So, and, and I know it can be confusing. So if there's anyone who has questions on this, happy to dive into that more at the end of the presentation. Thanks, Courtney. Go ahead. So as we can see is, uh, in general, the active duty military population obesity rates, um, they go at around the same pace, but not necessarily at the same level of obesity rates in the civilian population. So while we are seeing that um, active duty military populations are about half as obese as their uh, age adjusted civilian counterparts, um, we are seeing an alarming trend. And really, if we're just talking about obesity, this is the disease, the chronic disease of obesity, not just people who have a little bit of extra weight on them. Um, you can see that this is an escalating problem with over 21% of current active duty service members qualifying as having obesity. And uh, if we are going to believe that BMI is inaccurate, that means these numbers are even worse. So unfortunately, right, we don't have the ability to completely accurately peg everybody to a specific body fat percentage in the body um, just by looking at them. Uh, this is, you know, the closest that throughout all of the different tests of all the different systems have come to. It's this, and the reality is probably worse because of those uh, very concerns with BMI's accuracy. And what you can see is that, you know, before serving a lot of these guys, this number um, 30, 34, 34 uh, is the, you know, 92% of individuals who would qualify for military service in general in the civilian population. So in this case, it's individuals who are between the ages of 17 and 24 years old. 
And you can see that only about 30 of them right now across the country are a normal weight. And while that is a tragedy, right, you would expect that at the point of enlistment, most guys, you're imagining boot camp, you know, ready guys, um, 50% of them are a normal weight, but that unfortunately means that 40.3% of individuals are overweight and 8% of people are obese. And the reason why they're still being able to pass into being enlisted is because of the waivers, the exceptions, um, and the you know steady adjustments to body composition, height to weight ratios over time. Meaning that um, while clinically they might be overweight or obese, the US military or one of the individual services or even one of the recruiters or commanders has granted some form of either exception um, or placed them in a special program to get them to lose weight only at that point. Unfortunately, what we see is that by the time that you know, you're know you looking at all people in service, and again, this is still that 92% of people who are between the ages of um, 17 and 24, about, you know, 87% of them are enlisting for the first time going into their very first term. Um, they are unfortunately right back to where they would have been if they had been a civilian. And this can be confusing because you think, oh my goodness, um, I would have assumed that all of these guys just stay fit because they're doing exercises, um, their their food and their portions are being controlled for them in these kind of military food halls. And while you might be correct, uh, it's unfortunate but true that the U.S. military does not keep up with the same standards right throughout services they do during boot camp. Boot camp is obviously a really rigorous experience that people really can't maintain over a long period of time. Um, but the control that we have over the military environment is actually a positive thing because it means that when we're looking at this data, we can create policy recommendations that specify, right, how much of a portion people receive, how much they're working out every day. And what we're seeing right now is that these interventions just aren't being conducted, but they can be, right? Because you're absolutely right if you're in the audience thinking, hey, well, this clearly shows that even under extreme circumstances, people are still overweight. And that is 100% the case. Um, by age 35, unfortunately, you know, obesity rates are either meet or exceed that of the general population, depending on the service. And um, this is just a sign that the longer that you are in the military environment, uh, the more likely you are to become obese or overweight. And even in the veteran population, you're going to keep that weight on statistically much more than if you had remained a civilian the entire time. Courtney, do you have, do you have any idea as to why, why that is? I mean, basically you've got people that are, you know, slightly, you know, they're, they're about the same as the regular population going in at enlistment, you know, they've, they've made their qualifications, they're fit, you know, the, the numbers look good for them during service. You know, we see it going back to about the standard population, but by 35, those numbers are looking pretty rough. So is there any, is there any correlation or, or, or reason that you can identify for, for why this is trending so terribly? Yeah, so it's a number of factors and they'll play into some of our recommendations later on down the line. But when we do interview our service members and we take um, the time to really ask, hey, what's going on? Where, why are we seeing these kinds of trends? What we're hearing from people is that unfortunately it starts with being in an environment that is out of your control, stressful, you're receiving oftentimes very little sleep, you're away from your, your support system, your friends and your family, you may not have access to fresh fruits and vegetables like you did back at your house. Um, and these are all factors that tend to contribute, right, to weight gain in both civilian and military populations. So some people, you know, they feel this lack of control over their life and being able to stop by and grab a second portion of mashed potatoes or something, maybe that's their problem. For other people, it could be genetic. So about 40 to 70% of uh, obesity indicators, which are the kind of genetic uh, signifiers of obesity that you can um, expect to see in an individual who is or has obesity, uh, these are genetically passed down. So you can track these through family members and it only takes about two generations um, for these indicators to be substantial enough so that it's much harder for an individual to lose weight. And when we think about things like calories in, calories out, that's absolutely true. But what we're talking about is the metabolic activity, the endocrine malfunctions, and the other kind of physical symptoms of obesity that are why it was qualified as a, as a chronic disease in the first place, right? Because you're seeing individuals who's either brain 
brains or bodies have been rewired um, either over years of overeating from genetic indicators or from environmental factors, which are kind of called the obesogenic environment for you nerds out there. Um, the combination of all of these things means that in active duty service, people are struggling more with their weight. And because in a normal situation, you could just go to the doctor um, and in service, it's really not considered a disease. You, you are given um, some pretty strict uh, administrative sanctions or punishments if you do come forward and say, hey, I'm suffering with my weight or you've been found during a fitness test to be overweight. Um, and if you and your commander both agree that your weight is not at a point where you can manage it properly, it's not like you are in the civilian world and you go to a doctor, you explore different treatment methods, you see what kind of diet and exercise program works for you. For a lot of individuals, the problem here is that you have a uh, situation where people are just kind of being told to toughen up, right, um, to get over it, to uh gain more discipline, right? Or to be removed entirely from your unit, removed from your support system and placed in another boot camp, right? Um, and this is uh, something that is ostensibly supposed to get you back to a normal weight relatively free, like rapidly. Um, but what we're actually seeing is that because just like if you're doing a crash diet and you lose a bunch of weight really fast, you're 80% likely to gain it all back within two years. The cyclical form of dieting is something that ultimately causes more weight gain in the future. So if you're taking a guy who has been overweight his entire life, putting him through a crash diet through the, you know, future soldier preparatory course or boot camp to bring him down to a level that he's healthy enough to serve, and then you let him loose, um, unfortunately, what we see is that they're, will, they're, they're very, very likely to gain back all of that weight and more. And then when they do get pegged again as being obese for the second, third, fourth, fifth time um, and are given that crash diet again, the body and the mind both learn to conserve calories that you might go into starvation at any time. Um, and this and a combination of other kind of more internal medical factors make it so that you are more likely to continue to gain weight. By age 35, you may have gone through this process so many times that this is what your body knows and this is what your mind and and your brain knows right thanks courtney and as a reminder to the audience we do have open q a so please feel free to uh, add your questions and we'll try to pepper them in as we go along go ahead courtney so you know, let's say again, you, you're you still critical of kind of that this problem even exists, which is true for a lot of individuals, right? Uh, maybe you're kicking yourself in the audience and thinking like, oh, okay, I get that it's a problem. This is horrible. Or you already knew this was a problem, but maybe you're still concerned, right? You're thinking no way the data could be this bad. There's no way that the BMI could be so inaccurate and all of these people are, are having such a problem. Um, well, unfortunately, even if you remove BMI from the equation entirely and you just say, you know, here is a trend that we're seeing increasing over time pretty dramatically, 50% in just 10 years, right, of um, active duty service members went from being obese at a 10 percent ish kind of level to a 20 to 30, you know, 20, some services it's 30, uh, but for the average general Department of Defense, right, it's that 21%. Um, you might think, okay, what what's the big deal? Well, this is why. This is why it's a big deal. So we've seen a 56% rise in musculoskeletal injuries in 10 years. And since 2017, over and over and over again, the department has termed musculoskeletal injuries and not combat injuries. These are wear and tear injuries that are highly, highly correlated with obesity as the single most significant medical impediment to military readiness by the Department of Defense. So it's absolutely skyrocketed, right? The amount of guys who are suffering from sciatica, lower back pain, ankle sprains, um, doing all of the normal day-to-day -day activities or even easier day-to-day -day activities than they were doing five to 10 years ago. So COVID obviously exacerbated some of this, but even beforehand, you're looking at a lot of people who are at desk jobs, right? Active duty personnel aren't all infantry. There's a variety of different positions you could take. And a lot of these are desk and computer based. Um, and unfortunately, if they are sent out to go uh, do a hard exercise or even just day-to-day -day life, right, they're experiencing greater rates of injury. Um, and about 50% of military service members experience one or more musculoskeletal injury each year. So uh, it's not just a small problem. It's the leading contributor to disability and medical discharge for the U.S. military. Courtney, were you able to identify any particular um, occupational specialties in the military that are affected uh, particularly badly by, by this situation? Or is, is there any role that is more subject to, you know, rising weight than others? 
Yeah, um, and we can see not just by, because I could give you a list of occupations, right, that are more likely to be um, overweight, and I'm sure you could expect them, right? People who are sitting at desk jobs, specialist, intelligence, uh, IT, these are all positions that we see high amounts of uh, overweight and obesity. And if you're looking at kind of the overall um, unit or the overall kind of service position that these people are, are doing, they're spending much less calories than, for instance, your average infantryman is in a day, and then getting the exact same portions at their military meal halls, right? So that's one issue uh, that can be pretty easily corrected, though we'll talk about that a little later. Uh, and the second issue is that even among our infantry, they're still very, as long as you're enlisted, very, very likely to be overweight, hitting around 15 to 20 percent, depending on the service. And the reason for this is surprising, right? You think these are the guys who should be working out all the time. And the truth is, is that if you work out for an hour, which is pretty much all that people are somewhat required, it depends on the, the unit and the service and the role and the occupation, Um if you're working out for about an hour a day, most people burn about 100 to 200 calories doing that, right? And that can be great for heart health, great for musculature. Um, of course, being overweight doesn't prohibit you from having muscles or maintaining muscles. Fat is its own entity within the body. And having excess muscles doesn't mean that you don't also have the complications of excess fat if you are overweight or have obesity. And uh, what we're seeing is that infantry is some of the worst uh, populations in which the rates of obesity are highest. And when we talk to these guys saying like, hey, what do you think is the problem in your unit or in your service or in your life? People say, well, you know, when I was deployed, I I was in a desert. We didn't have fresh fruits or vegetables delivered to us. We had the same meals and eating besides working out, you know, for an hour a day and burning those 200 calories was the only thing we really had to do, right? It was like eating, smoking, drinking, um, and all of these activities make it harder to lose weight and easier to gain weight. So in reality, you might think, oh, these guys are so fit, but you really can't run off uh, a poor diet or, or um, something like high stress, low sleep. Those are all things that you really need uh, in order for your body to be able to restore its its typical functionality, its its oxygenation rates and all these other things that, that medical um, professionals talk about. Um, and unfortunately, you know, having this kind of low oxygenation rate, high endocrine malfunction activity and the other kind of comorbidities of, of obesity, this has all resulted in chronic disease rates escalating at the exact same pace as obesity does. So if you're, you know, a little critical about the idea that obesity is actually related to some of these other conditions, such as diabetes, heart disease, stroke, pulmonary embolisms, um, unfortunately, you know, these things have all increased in tandem at pretty much exactly the same rates over time as obesity has. And scientists, medical professionals, both within and outside the Department of Defense, have clearly delineated causation between having this degree of excess fat, specifically, right, excess adipose tissue or, or visceral fat with these conditions. Um, and we spend over $1.5 billion annually on obesity-related health care as a result. Uh, in addition, if you're more on like the combat readiness side versus the wellness side, right? Because there's two uh, impacts on the force as we know it. Our overweight active duty personnel cost the DOD 103 million because of 658,000 lost work days, and they're leaving service 18 months earlier than their normal weight counterparts. And this is regardless of whether they started or ended overweight. If you are, you know, overweight, regardless of what program or waiver or exception you were granted, even if you were so physically fit, right, that you never have to be tested for your height or weight ratio again, because you've gotten a permanent exception from that, that standard, you're still more likely to leave service 18 months earlier. And this is a problem that we're seeing across all of the services. In addition, you know, those replacement costs are high. It costs about $170,000 to replace an active duty service member. Um, and because we've seen so many of these individuals leaving service so much earlier than everybody else, you know, and we're still responsible for making sure that they're covered under VA benefits or whatever other, you know, category was causing them to have to leave early in the first place, we are costing 
ourselves and our and our department and our taxpayers an extraordinary amount of money in making sure um, that these people are taken care of later on down the line. And if we just started right by taking care of them preemptively by sending people to doctors and getting people treated um, and lowering their weight in the beginning when they were still not necessarily facing symptoms, but we're at that indicator that they're going to start having and experiencing symptoms shortly. Um, we would be able to avoid the vast majority of this because conditions like diabetes and heart disease, if managed properly and early, do not cause significant long-term effects on health. And I think, um, you know, when we're looking at a lot of these cases, the people who are being sent out on 60%, 70%, 100% disability for these conditions, you know, it's gone on so long that their body is irreparably damaged. And I think we should avoid this at absolutely all costs because it doesn't just hurt them, right? It hurts our, our combat readiness and it, and it hurts our, our force. Uh, as a result of the kind of cyclical weight management we talked about earlier, eating disorder diagnoses have increased by approximately 79% between 2017 and 2021. So eating disorder rates have long been higher than in the general civilian population, um, but that's just diagnoses, right? A lot of people would not consider, for instance, fasting or um, drinking lots of water or exercising for four hours a day before a weigh-in as having an eating disorder. A lot of people who we talked to in our in our investigation said, I don't have an eating disorder. Go, don't get me wrong. I do not have an eating disorder. I just needed to drop 18 pounds, right, in a month to meet my weigh-in. And so I was throwing up every day, was taking pills, diuretic or otherwise, over the counter or through, you know, black market, gray market pharmacies, um, or exercising with my buddies four hours a day to lose that weight. But I don't have an eating disorder. Don't get me wrong. It's just something that I have to do to meet weight every six months to a year. And that's something where um, when that stigma exists, when being labeled with something makes you an outcast or feel stigmatized about members of your in-group, uh, you're not going to report these problems and you're not going to get help for these problems. But, you know, what we're seeing is that even though, you know, the actual technical rates of eating disorders have increased over time, um, the amount of people who are using these like diuretics, vomiting, fasting, or under the table diet pills has remained relatively steady. And a giant contributor to this is people wanting to make weight. Um, unfortunately, we see that over time, both the cyclical weight gain and loss, as well as these harmful behaviors have led to increased suicide risk, eating disorder risk, um, and other risks of serious and chronic diseases, such as, you know, esophageal cancer, uh, among these individuals who who say, you know, to either researchers, RAND, ourselves, right, the forces themselves, um, that they are having these problems, but don't classify me as, as having an eating disorder, right? And this means that they can't really get help. And finally, if this hasn't all convinced you, right, um, like I mentioned before, we look at two sides of this problem. One is wellness. This is making sure that when people enter the military, they are granted the opportunity to improve their lives. And part of that is having a physical fitness level that is either equivalent or better than the general population because they're sacrificing so much. Um, and the other is combat readiness. So unlike the general civilian population, we care not just about our citizens' health, we're caring about specifically their ability to perform in high stakes situations. Uh, and we always have to be ready, right? We always have to make sure that these guys are not just meeting the bare minimum threshold of fitness, but going beyond that and being able to be even more capable than your average everyday person when it comes to being put in these hazardous situations. So the physical fitness of the force has declined in key areas as a result of both letting in more individuals who are unfit to start with and giving them an environment in active duty that makes it more likely for them to gain weight. So as a result of that, right, you see that from the 2017 to 2021, the average amount of push-ups that guys have, you know, this is males specifically, because for women, it's always been a little different. Um, the average amount of push-ups a guy could do was 63 in 2017 to 18 in 2023, right? The average pull-ups that people were doing on their on their regular physical fitness tests went from 19 to 12. Um, and because these standards have been weakened, not just at the point of enlistment, but also during their regular fitness trainings and fitness tests, um, and especially in their, you know, combat and kind of physical, you know, power and weight and lifting and running tasks, 
um, they're being given additional exceptions. So in 2017, you could choose to do push-ups in the Marines, or you could choose to do an alternate activity, right? And about 35% of Marines elected to do push-ups. And when they did elect to do push-ups, they did about 63 of them. In 2021, just 5% of male Marines exercised this option. And of those people who are saying, this is my thing, this is my jam, I'm going to take you know, push-ups as my choice of demonstrating physical fitness, they could only do 18. So this is a problem that we're seeing, not just because of weakened fitness standards, but also, you know, um, weakness in general of the force, you know, as a, as a result or correlated with the rise in obesity. So I think it's obvious by now, but existing strategies are no longer working. What should we do? The existing strategy so far has been to let more people in, reduce fitness standards, make it easier for them to pass tests that monitor their physical and combat fitness, and then, you know, tell people that they're fine, that they don't need to see a doctor, that they should toughen up, right? And they should, if they want to participate in some of these programs that are basically like a glorified fat camp where you're put through a lot of rigorous diet and exercise that you're not going to be able to implement in your day-to-day -day life once you return back to your unit. Um, and then telling them if they continue to do that, you know, you're removed from service. Within six months to a year of, uh, you know, poor performance in one of these programs that you're supposed to be taking if you're if you're overweight and you agree to them, um, you, you could be removed administratively separated for being overweight, even though it's technically a, you know, clinical diagnosis, a chronic disease that is recognized by so many other groups and the federal government itself recognizes. Um, the U.S. Government Accountability Office has found broad, you know, use and misuse of codes that are academic codes to describe people who have obesity or one of its associated clinical conditions. So the odds of being uh, administratively punished is much higher than your odds of being able to see like a weight loss specialist, for example, or be diagnosed with a specific um, comorbidity and be seen for those conditions. And this is something that we just cannot continue to allow because as you've seen, uh, it's unfortunately something that's just going to continue to get worse as the overall civilian rate of obesity in this country gets worse. So um, at this point, right, I think it's about time that we finally go over here. Uh, I understand, you know, that in the short term, we do sacrifice cost savings in the sense that in the very short term, initiating these programs, whether they be pilot or broad programs, do cost money and time and effort and the opinions of experts who would be hired to come in and, and solve some of these problems. But unfortunately, you know, what we see is, is that the services aren't doing that because they're either worried about these short-term cost savings, they don't actually believe it's as bad of a problem, or because each of the individual services have military leaders who are not active in every single part of every process and the siloing between the health services people and the people designed to um, improve health and the forces are very different than the individuals who are commanders or military leaders responsible for establishing discipline. And right now, since weight is under discipline in that kind of categorization of responsibility and not under health, um, we're not seeing people bridge that, that barrier and build that bridge that would be needed to combine these, um, these problems. So I, I know, right, scientists know and have known for about 10 years that starting when someone is just beginning to have symptoms, um, treating their conditions early leads to much, much higher cost savings down the line. Um, and so for that reason, you know, I, I really don't see a downside to it. instead of ignoring or, or, or telling people that they need to just buckle up or toughen up um, and just start losing weight already, uh, that we really need to be enforcing these sustainable weight management initiatives. Uh, and I know that seems crazy because if you just started as, oh, okay, what are those weight management initiatives, right? You're already thinking further ahead than a lot of the individuals um, who we get to talk to in this process. So our, our first stage of this research, and there will be much more to come, um, is really just bringing awareness to this problem getting the, the largest problems of the current system out there. Um, and we do have recommendations that we'll be able to explore, hopefully, right, in future area batches of research in future years. So we have um, our first recommendation is just to bring awareness to the fact that obesity is a chronic condition. It is a chronic disease. It's not a lapse in willpower. And if it was and it could be easily solved, right, we wouldn't be facing this enormous obesity epidemic that we currently are. Uh, rep recommendation two is to 
find appearance-based regulations and replace them with evidence-based regulations. So right now, a lot of our military policies in regards to body composition and military appearance focus on the military appearance. And it means granting commanders the authority to tell an individual, you look too fat, therefore you are fat. Or on the contrary, this happens more often, right? You don't look that fat to me. We haven't run any tests, but I think you're probably fine and just letting people continue to serve and not, you know, referring them to doctors or referring them to programs that could help them lose weight, simply saying you're okay. And this is something that happens on senior levels much more than it does at lower levels, right? Because how difficult is it to tell someone that you admire or respect, possibly somebody that's multiple levels above you, um, I'm sorry, sir, you're going to have to get removed and be placed in the same kind of program as, as a first year infantry, for example, because your numbers are coming back poorly. And recommendation three, improve timely screenings and diagnosis. If you are an individual, you know, in that 1% of the population, the military population, who is accidentally prescribed or categorized as being overweight by BMI, but in reality, you're just so muscular or fit um, that you're in that tiny, tiny group of exceptions, that should be the end for you once you see a doctor or you just see someone who's qualified, a dietitian, someone with a little more experience than your everyday commander. Um, once you're determined fit and healthy, you go right back into service. And I think that is a very, very small price to pay for the 99% of individuals, right, who are currently undercategorized as having excess fat and need a timely screening or a diagnosis to be able to forge a path forward for them. Um, this is something that is very cheaply conducted. Diabetes screenings cost less than $30. Uh, and of course, when you compare it against the $1.5 to $2.5 million in average diabetes cost care for later in life, I say $30, you know, absolutely send them to it. Um, what we're seeing is that only about 7% of individuals who meet pre-diabetes screening indicators are actually getting referred to clinicians and even fewer are actually getting treatment. So what we can do now is a very easy test, right, is instead of having a commander be the ultimate judge of whether or not someone is overweight simply by looking at them, um, use this test that we currently have that is the best, right, continue to be looking for more and more accurate tests, of course, always, um, but take the most cost effective metric that we have, which is BMI, that 99% of people, you know, are correctly categorized by, and then make sure that those people are able to be referred to a doctor. If they decide, of course, that they know, don't want to participate in any sort of program, um, it would be the same as if, you know, you had a broken leg and you decided not to participate in any sort of program uh, or an ankle sprain or back problems, right? Um, we're just asking at this stage to have obesity be recognized for what it is and for be recognized in the way that all other countries pretty much in the Western world are currently categorizing it as. A recommendation four, um, if somebody is suffering from a obesity related condition, treat them medically, right? Uh, and that's similar to the previous recommendation since I went a little over our, our scope for that recommendation. But if somebody does have either a genetic kind of indicator, a, a hormone problem, a um, uh, a, a simple other type of thing that can be easily managed like a heart disease or, or um, you know, increased adipose tissue dysfunction, those can be treated. And military science has come a really long way in 10 years. So I really think that this is something that uh, we have the capacity to do. It is in our best interest to do, and it is the most cost-effective thing to do. And recommendation five is Courtney, to- Courtney, real quick, yeah. uh, an audience member asked something about uh, anti-obesity medications. Uh, are there particular nuances on the coverage of that or, or what, oh, or actually, absolutely. what actually qualifies as medical, as medical treatment? Yeah. Um, and first of all, just I am not a medical professional. What I am about to say is by no means medical advice. <laughs> I just want to precurse that. Um, so I am not personally able to say this one specific treatment method is going to work for this whole population. And what we see is that because the causes of obesity are so diverse, that the treatments are also incredibly diverse. And what works for one person may not work for another simply because they are suffering from excess fat and if due to different reasons, right? Um, but in general, this is one of many treatment options that should be considered if you are sitting at a you know, dentist or doctor's office and you have a lot of different options in front of you, um, just like a civilian would. So if you know the FDA, who is responsible for making sure that things are safe, um, 
is authorizing a specific treatment plan for a specific individual, typically, right, TRICARE, which controls kind of the uh, authorization and insurance benefits of whatever individual goes through their way, whether that be a veteran or, or an active duty um, service member, you're going to see somebody um, in a doctor's office and be granted most of, but not all of the same medications, um, right to access medications as someone in that civilian population, not when it comes to weight loss drugs. So right now, um, this is something where unfortunately, you know, service members, if they've tried absolutely everything else, if they've gone through, you know, months of rigorous diet and exercise, then they take months of a specific uh, you know, uh, adipose kind of restoration thing. And then they take this other, you know, medication and this other medication and this other medication all through the line. It can take you about two to three years. Then you can have your doctor submit a form to be considered for, you know, in this case, uh, um, the, the subcutaneous, you know, injection of Wagyu B for only 30 days. And as anyone who's tried to lose weight knows, 30 days is typically not enough. Um, and unfortunately, you know, even clinicians and doctors tend to say that it, 30 days on, on these types of medications isn't quite sufficient. Um, so it's a journey. I think that definitely more research needs to be conducted into that area. But for one, that's not the only medication that's out there. There are a whole slew of other options for people. Um, and until you even just see a specialist, you're not going to know what those are. Uh, so there really isn't one size fits all option, but I think it is um, unfortunate that the, one of the most promising op options is not currently being authorized. Um, and our recommendation number five, right, kind of fits to the first standard of care, which is get people healthy food <laughs> and enable them to exercise in the way that they want to exercise. So if you are in a boat in the Navy, which is a population who unfortunately um, does suffer from overwhelmingly high levels of obesity compared to other populations. The most frequent thing I hear is I'm stuck on a boat. You know, what am I going to do? We have two uh, treadmills in the lower decks and both of them are broken at any given time because we don't have a treadmill replacement uh, engineer on board. So uh, what are we supposed to do exactly for exercise? And obviously there's runs around the block and stuff, but as we've mentioned previously, you really can't over outrun a difficult diet. So if you are sitting in a situation where you're kind of hurry up and wait, you don't have a lot of other options for entertainment um, or personal wellness, you may overeat and statistically you're more likely to overeat. So reducing the factors that enable people to overeat in these types of situations is helpful. Clear portion sizes, right? With a number of calories that is suited for an individual who might be at a desk all day versus someone who's running laps or doing exercises all day or in a specialist position. Um, those things can be controlled. And we know that they can be controlled because if you are a special ops or other form of person who, you know, is expected to be doing these types of really rigorous uh, activities and combat operative uh, abilities every single day, those guys have very little to non-existent rates of overweight and obesity. And they're not going through a different program as everybody else, as far as, you know, having their diet and exercise controlled. And we know that it's possible. We just have to be able to extend the same level of care to your average infantryman and enlisted as we do to people who are in those other lines of work. And our sixth recommendation is just improve transparency and reporting of obesity data. And really this is where it starts because if we don't have the data and information to craft a recommendation, things are only gonna get worse and we're not going to know why. So having that ability to look at either, you know, an individual basis, a unit basis, a system or a, you know, a service basis and an entire DOD basis and being able to track trends consistently over time is absolutely critical. And what we need is not more people who are PR or communications folks saying, here, I'm cherry picking this data and I'm going to present whatever the best um, looking metrics are at any given time to the people who I'm being interviewed with. Um, we need to see stuff that's more comprehensive and holistic and has a civilian oversight mechanism because right now all of the information that I've presented in my slides so far has come directly from the Department of Defense, but what we see is what they choose to share with us because you have to be either in the Department of Defense 
or authorized by and overseen by a Department of Defense researcher in order to access any of this data. And a number of researchers have told us that they face difficulties in getting accurate information on this issue, simply because, you know, there's too much stigma. People don't want to project a weak image of our, our armed forces, um, or people are either confused or feel like the fact that we have an obesity problem in our military is a reflection of the discipline and willpower of the force. And and that's not true, right? Um, obviously, we're publishing stuff on how many guys are breaking legs, how many guys um, are, are suffering from uh, osteoarthritis or, you know, any of these other kind of less controversial conditions. But we're not tracking how many people have obesity right now. And because of that, we're having a very hard time connecting the dots between people who are overweight in service, but those numbers aren't being published anywhere, and why they're leaving service. So, that was the end of my um, slide. I know that was a lot. So thank you everybody for, for listening in um, and being here with us today. I, I do want to just say that this is something that I know faces a lot of kind of so social and cultural hostility simply because the topic itself is, is difficult to talk about, honestly. Um, but really what our research hopes to convey is that we need to be treating our service members, number one, better than our civilian population is. And right now, you know, that's unfortunately not happening. And number two, giving everybody the access that they need uh, to be able to make the best choices for themselves. And if we do this, I genuinely think that it would improve the amount of people who are willing, right? In that kind of Venn diagram, we're not just looking at the people who are qualified, but also the people who are willing because they're seeing their peers, um, their advisors, their family members have a good time, come out of their service healthier and happier than they were before, um, and, and be successful uh, going forward. So that's that's my piece, um, and I'm happy to take any other questions. Uh, unfortunately, we're out of time for questions. Uh, we did try to weave a, a couple uh, audience questions in there, so I thank everybody for their time today and for, for joining us. As you can see, this is a, an important topic. You know, We've seen a number of headlines covering our research on it, so uh, we're going to be digging into this more and hope you'll stay tuned. Uh, there'll be a lot more to come on this. Uh, our next event will be November 14th in Iowa. Uh, if you know folks in Iowa City who are interested in coming to learn about climate change and its impacts on uh, the military population and our military assets in Iowa, I encourage you to check out our website, americansecurityproject.org, and spread the word. Uh, until next time, thanks everyone for joining.